So now, Peter, let's talk about the theoretical side a little bit. Particle physics is about understanding the most fundamental objects in the universe. So my understanding is that we have matter and energy, which are roughly interchangeable with each other. But is there anything that's more basic than anything else? Uh, you know, that's a great question. In a sense, uh, I would say the answer is always we don't know. That's why we build machines like the LHC to find out you know, what is the most fundamental thing. We've always looked at shorter and shorter distance scales, right? You build microscopes and then colliders to look at shorter and shorter distance scales. But right now, the standard model, the theory that seems to be working, is that uh, everything we see in the universe is made out of particles. And those are the fundamental objects of our theory. So everything around you uh, whether it's this table or light shining on you or the stars, it's all particles. Every force is transmitted by particles. Gravity is probably transmitted by a particle. So that's probably the most fundamental object. Now we have another still picture which I'd like to bring up which shows some aspects of the standard model. Do we have that other image? There it is. So we have quarks, leptons, and forces, and that's the Higgs boson in the middle there. So, mm -hmm. so what is this chart really telling us? Uh, well, this actually is very neat because it summarizes uh, essentially the entire universe. All the fundamental laws of physics are contained in that little graphic. Uh, we believe everything we see can be explained by just those particles. You see just a handful of particles. Um, for example, all of our matter is made out of those quarks. They make up the nucleus of the atom or the electron going around it. And uh, all the interactions, everything, all the complex stuff that gives rise to stars shining and everything comes from those four fundamental forces, the gravity, electromagnetism, the strong and weak nuclear forces. So as far as we've seen so far, that explains everything. That explains every experiment we've ever done. And now we, it was actually a, a really great theoretical triumph. Mm -hmm. You could see the, uh, all these other particles of the standard model. I would say at the same time the discovery of the Higgs boson is a great experimental triumph, it was also a great triumph for the theorists because they saw all these particles of the standard model and they realized there had to be one missing. You, you tried to fit them into this nice tight mathematical framework and you realized there had to be a Higgs boson. And now, several decades later, uh, it's been found experimentally. So that's sort of a major triumph. Uh, now talking about basic stuff, what about space itself? Is space something basic? Is space just emptiness? <laughs> Or is it some kind of material, some kind of substance that can be manipulated? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And actually, you know, that was the real change between uh, Newton and Einstein. For Newton, space was a background empty stage, and particles just ran around on top of it. But Einstein, I think maybe the, the right way to describe his great realization, uh, his general theory of gravity, of relativity, uh, was that actually, no, space is dynamical. Space can move itself. Um, space is sort of on equal footing with everything else. Uh, so actually we believe all the time when the Earth moves through space, it's warping, it's pulling on the space around it, and actually that's what's causing gravity. So is that what a field is? When you say that there's a field, is a field just some kind of bending of space? Oh, actually, that's a, that's a great question. I would say it's sort of the other way around. Uh, space is a field. Space is just one example of a field. The Higgs boson is another example. And they all can warp and bend and move in funny ways. And sort of the really cool thing is that space is another one of those. It is a field like that, and that's all gravity is. Now, are matter and energy basically interchangeable? Um, and what makes one change? Are they basically the same thing, and we just look at it from a different aspect each time? Or does it really change itself? Uh, sort of. The, you know, uh, Einstein taught us uh, matter is just another form of energy, right? His famous equation, E equals mc squared, basically says uh, matter, mass, is one type of energy. So at the LHC, if you want to make uh, a particle like the Higgs boson, which has a very high mass, you take two very light particles and bang them together. Now normally, uh, if you're combining, you know, jars of sand or bottles of water or something, you can't get more mass than you started with. But at the LHC, they do. They take these protons and they bang them together to get something with much more mass. That's only possible because they accelerate them to such high energies, and then they then convert that energy into the mass of the Higgs boson. So they are basically interchangeable with a lot of work <laughs> by dedicated experimentalists. So what's the hottest work in experimental particle physics right now, or theoretical particle physicists? What, what's the next step that you're looking for? Either one of you can answer that. You know, actually, for the experiment at the moment, uh, as I said, uh, the, the immediate step is now we produced a, a f a some amount of the Higgs-like uh, Higgs particle. Then we need to see there are more data coming. 
So we need to analyze uh, this state to see if, is it really the Higgs boson or is maybe the cousins of it or something else. So we need to look at the property of this particle. But behind that, as I mentioned, there are other things we're not happy with, uh, with the theory. We're mi missing pieces of uh, things beyond to explain all of this, why it's actually come together like this. Then for those uh, things, we're actually looking for ad additional particle, new particles, which have a completely different behavior from Higgs, but more like the partner of the existing particles. And those will probably have a very high masses. So those are the, the things we are actually pursuing, trying to look for uh, maybe a dark matter candidate, which is essentially invisible. You have to see or maybe something, evidence of something which is invisible went through the, uh, actually produced in the experiment. And or there are other heavy particles, which uh, like a mirroring image, but except the mass is heavier compared to the existing particles we know about. So there might be totally new types of particles that we've never seen or imagined, but mm -hmm. uh, the standard model only has a few things in it. Maybe it's just a small representation of what's really out there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And actually, we know there are new things. As Sudong mentioned, we know there's dark matter. We look out and see how our galaxy is rotating, and we can see there's more mass there that we cannot see. We can see its gravitational effect. And uh, there's a lot of reasons to think that the LHC may actually be able to produce the dark matter particle. And then, as Sudong mentioned, what you would see is the lack of anything. <laughs> now, what are the practical benefits of this research? We're always looking for more energy to feed our industrial economy. Is there some energy locked up in these particles that maybe we can tap in a way that's you know, more efficient than uh, you know, nuclear fission with uranium? Well, I think it's, it's difficult to uh, think of exactly how you tap into it at the moment. But I think as time goes on, people will probably find interesting ways of uh, real, how to relate to that energy and maybe there's a way to utilizing it. But at the moment, I think uh, this still is more of a fundamental physics and we'll see just what it is and how to utilize it, I think, may take some more time, say the next generation mm -hmm. of people gradually coming out with ideas to how, mm -hmm. how right. to utilize it. Now, some people say that CERN is really a great exercise in international collaboration. And just the kind of teamwork involved in the free scientific exchange has a lot of value in itself, apart from the actual discoveries, just the basic culture of CERN makes a major contribution. Yes, it's actually very interesting, I think, uh, how, how CERN came together, given that uh, the, the role of each country probably within the world scene is, uh, is limited. But when CERN came together, I think is a very interesting a model for international collaboration with all the uh, states in Europe come together to make a very large international organization. They can pull enough funding and uh, human resource together to create a big project like this, which will be very hard for individual country to produce that. And that set a very good precedent, I think, of how these collaborative uh, international collaborations can actually utilize the resources of the world to actually produce these uh, scientific results, otherwise it would be just impossible to achieve. Yeah, this is extremely expensive, obviously. A ring 17 or 20, 17 kilometers, 20, uh, so 27, 27 kilometers in circumference, that's pretty big. Mm -hmm. uh, is it hard to squeeze money out of governments for this sort of thing? <laughs> yes, this is actually a big international treaty, uh, which actually set up CERN to actually allow this to happen. Mm -hmm. And also, it's very interestingly, every other year, there will be some country decided mm -hmm. uh, maybe we cannot afford to pay the, uh, the subscription and so on. There will be uh, some debate and so on, but invariably, uh, people will come back to the same table to say mm -hmm. this is important enough for, for Europe as a whole, and uh, then things will continue as it mm -hmm. used that's, to be. That's really actually one of the really fun mm -hmm. things right. about being a physicist, that uh, you meet people from all over the world, you work with them, they all have the same goal. And we're going to have to wrap on that note because we are out of time. I'd like to thank my two guests for being here today, Su Dong, experimental particle physicist at SLAC, Peter Graham, theoretical particle physicist, Stanford Physics Department. Thank you for watching. Visit us at www.futuretalk.net. For Future Talk, I'm Marty Wasserman. We'll see you next time.